evening, everyone. My name is Journey Botteach, and I am in a unique position to welcome all of you on behalf of both This World, the Jewish Values Network, who organized this evening's event, as well as Yeshiva University, who so graciously is hosting it. Tonight, we are so honored to be joined by three global leaders. Here to introduce them is my father and the moderator of tonight's event, Rabbi Shmuley Botteach. First and foremost, the number one philanthropist, Jewish philanthropist in the entire world, and one of the foremost Jewish philanthropists of all time, and a couple whose very name has become synonymous, synonymous with Jewish identity, support for the State of Israel, and Jewish pride, Mr. Sheldon Adelson. <laughs> to my right, uh, my very dear friend, who went to become the foreign affairs columnist for the Wall Street Journal, which he currently is, as well as deputy editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal. And for those of us who know and love Brett and who have been his friends uh, for many years, we were so proud when in 2013, just a few months back, he won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary. Ladies and gentlemen, Brett Stevens. Before Richard Joel became the president of Yeshiva University, he was the international head of Hillel. He is widely credited with having revolutionized Hillel and, and revamped its, its programming. He instilled Jewish pride. Uh, his whole program of getting kids just to do Jewish became uh, something legendary on campuses. And uh, it was largely because of his phenomenal success heading Hillel's across the nation that he was chosen to become the fourth president of Yeshiva University. Ladies and gentlemen, our host this evening, Dr. Richard Joel. Thank you. The question of will Jews exist with an existential threat against the state of Israel in the form of Iran and a nuclear weapon being developed, whether it's a uranium weapon, a plutonium weapon, and with assimilation being so rampant in the United States and with that devastating, catastrophic Pew Research poll that just came out that seemed to indicate that with the exception of the Orthodox community, American Jewry are slowly disappearing. You would support negotiations with Iran currently so long as they first seized all enrichment of uranium? No. What do you mean support negotiations? What are we going to negotiate about? Uh, you pick up your cell phone and you call somewhere in Nebraska and you say, okay, let it go. So there's an atomic weapon goes over ballistic missiles in the middle of the, middle of the desert that doesn't hurt a soul. Maybe a couple of rattlesnakes and scorpions or whatever. And then you, and then you say, see, the next one is in the middle of Tehran. So we mean business. You want to be wiped out? Go ahead and take a tough position and continue with your nuclear development. You want to be peaceful? You want to be peaceful? Just reverse it all, and we will guarantee you that you can have a, a, a nuclear power plant for electricity purposes. You recently wrote a column that, that upset a lot of people. You said that Ehud Olmert should really be the Prime Minister of Israel right now, not Benjamin Netanyahu, because Netanyahu, you said, was all hat and no cattle. He talks a big talk. You predicted that he would go to the UN and say yet again, I'm laying down a line. We're going to attack Iran. We may have to act alone. You said Olmert actually did it with serious nucle uh, nuclear facilities. The next morning, the Prime Minister of Israel saw you, kind of joked with you a little bit about it. But uh, were you serious about the article? Do you really think that Benjamin Netanyahu is not ready to strike Iran amidst this existential threat that they pose to Israel's uh, continuity? I want to make just one ancillary point that, in a sense, touches on what you've just said. But it's important because I suspect there are people here who want to paint what's going on on the stage as this demonstration of insane right-wing craziness. You know, you want to bomb Iran, you're warmongers, et cetera. Okay? I want these people, whoever you are in the audience, to think of this. A regime that is capable of taking a stone in one hand and stoning a woman to death. A regime that hangs gay people from cranes in the streets of Tehran should not, under any circumstances, get anywhere near a nuclear bomb so they can do likewise to other people. 
the people who keep saying we need to conciliate with Iran, we need to find a modus vivendi with them, we need to meet them halfway, okay, are objectively fellow traveling with one of the most repressive regimes in the world today. And by the way, when you ask about Rouhani, whatever he is now, he's a moderate, he's not such a moderate, he has been a fellow traveler, in fact, a senior member of a regime that has done more harm and caused more mayhem to its own pe with its own people and to other people, not the least of whom are Jews, for 34 years. So people who go out and say, oh, those crazy right-wingers are warmongers against Iran, okay? We need to find peace with Iran. You're finding peace with a regime that is the number one repressor of women, of gay people, of religious minorities, of Jews, and so on. If you call yourself a liberal under those circumstances, you need to re-examine what your liberalism is all about. Oh. And we are, we are hoping to diminish the reluctance of both Jewish and non-Jewish college students to look at Israel in a different way. That's why, hence the name, Rethink Israel. The second thing is I want to mention for what the professor said is um, the Pew Research Report. I found good news in that report, and I found bad news. The good news is that the birthright experience was the, the conclusions of birthright were exactly identical to the Pew Research Report. The 42% and the 58%. 42% of young Jewish kids between 18 and 26 say they intend to marry within the religion and or bring their children of Jewish. That's good because I've been pitching that for the last several years in which Mary and I have been involved with birthright since 07. The bad news is that it's 42 and 58%. The same thing. Two more generations, maybe three, there won't be any secular Jews left. There won't be any need for federations, no need for synagogues, no need for Jewish community centers, no need for Jewish family services agencies, no, for, no need for anything. Jewish won't be here. The one thing that Jews have been striving for for thousands of years, acceptance as a first-class citizen to be assimilated into the society and let go out of the jail of the Pale of Settlement. But Hillel, wasn't that your model? You didn't give up on the universities. You believed that something could be done to fight for Israel. And can we have a Jewish identity without a Jewish religion? At Hillel, were you trying to get people to keep basic mitzvot as well? Or was it Jewish culture you were trying to promote? Can't have a Jewish identity without a Jewish story. And if you think that by simply saying that Israel is a great bastion, it'll work for this generation and the next one, but not after. The greatness of birthright is not just that it strengthens the Jew's connection to Israel and the Jew's connection to his or her own story, but the great challenge, as yet unfulfilled, is when those young people come back from birthright, we haven't yet figured out how to launch them on their Jewish journey. But I was also very taken when you talked, Sheldon, about, about nobility because uh, 10 years ago, I stood on this stage when I was inaugurated as president, and I said that in my mind, the purpose of education is to ennoble and enable. It's not just the transfer of information, which more and more is what happens on American university campuses. It's also instilling in young people a sense of who they are, where they've come from, what their history is, and what their destiny is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for participating in this very spirited conversation.